Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Part 13. The cat coughed. It was closer now, off to the left, slipping through the gla grass, shadowing them. They'd have a better chance if they could reach the library. Perhaps Ballard would have his own weapon and could help them deal with the cat. Also, it would have to make its attack in the open. The Bengal veered wide, coming in from the flank to cut them off. Noise, said Logan. He began clapping his hands together. Jess followed this example. The tiger hesitated. The sudden noise startled it, diverted its course. They reached the library steps, mounted them hurriedly. A scrabble of claws on limestone. The Bengal roared, charged. Logan swept up the gun. The huge, muscled cat was in the air, jaws slavering wide as the gun cracked. The tangler caught the beast in midstep, filling its mouth and throat with metal filament mesh, webbing the great head in clock coils of steel, wrapping a shiny cocoon over the striped body. The cat smashed into Logan, driving him down. Logan's head struck the limestone wall, stunning him. Doubled into a spitting ball, the tiger clawed at the mesh. Bellowing in pain and frustration, it tried to loosen the thick webbing, but each convulsive movement caused the strands to constrict, work deeper into the beast's throat. As Jess watched, helpless, the tiger thrashed closer to Logan. It had a front leg free now, and its claw scored the stone. A tall shadow filled the doorway, corded muscle, a lean face, a presence, watching. Logan shook his head dazedly. The great cat's head was inches from his, and he found himself staring into the murder depths of the Bengal's glazing eyes. Now the free claw swung up to eviscerate the hated man-thing. Logan rolled aside. Chips of scored stone powdered his shoulder as the claw missed. He shrank back, ducking, attempting to slide along the wall away from the cat. But the tiger blocked him, trapped him in an angle between the wall and balustrade. Logan kicked at the beast's head with his boot, bone crunched. The Bengal roared in pain. Its body arched spastically. He kicked again, trying to gain room to stand. Inner agony took the beast. Its hindquarters smashed down on Logan's left leg, pinning him. Any moment now and the claw might slice into him. The shadow figure in the doorway moved. A 42-year-old man faced them. His lined face held a double lifetime. His hair was streaked with gray. A legend. A myth. A night dream come alive. Ballard, gasped Jess. He was tall, dressed in dark blues, with a hunting longbow in one hand, notched in the bow, a steel arrow. He did not speak. His eyes were flat and cold and unreadable. The Bengal stirred, sobbed air, its free leg jerked. The cat focused on Logan, glared at him. A rattling growl announced its hate. Logan tried to rise, but his leg was held by the beast's weight. Kill it, Jess cried to Ballard. Use the bow! The tall man shook his head. Logan's gun lay on the wet stone where it had fallen. Ballard moved to it, kicked the weapon over the edge of the steps. Finally, with a final convulsive spasm, the cat died. One moment it was a straining mass of claw and sinew and dense packed muscle. The next, it was dead meat, growing cold. Logan levered the inert body from his leg. Stiffly, he got to his feet. The bow followed him up, the notched arrow centered on his chest. Jess looked accusingly at Ballard. You would have let it kill him. Yes, he said. His voice was deep, rasping. Indeed I would. Logan shifted his feet, moved slightly to the left. Ballard's jaw tightened. He drew back the bowstring until the feathered tip of the arrow touched his right ear. But he's a runner, pleaded Jess. He saved my life. He's also Logan Three from DS, said Ballard. The bowstring tightened. Logan looked at death. Instantly, Jess launched herself. She hit Ballard's side, jolting him. Her hands came up to scratch at his face. With a hitch of one shoulder, he threw her off and she tumbled to the steps. But Logan was moving. Taking advantage of the brief scuffle, he had darted into the gloomed interior of the library. An arrow sung past him as Logan stumbled and hit the floor, sliding. He plowed forward trying to adjust to the lack of light. He tripped again, falling heavily as a second arrow flashed past him to bury itself in the looming mass of a bookshelf. Logan penetrated farther into the musty depths of the building. Volumes of all sizes laid in faded, distort 
disordered piles on the floor and tables. Bookshelves spewed forth their contents in shredded confusion. The place smelled of dying paper and rotted bindings. Rats and lizards scuttled away from as he, him as he rolled behind an upended tangle of shelving. A bright beam lanced into the dark room, a pinlight spot sweeping back and across, up and down. The light found him. Logan rolled away from it, scrambled to his feet. The light followed. He ducked as a steel arrow thunked solidly into the table next to his head. He edged back. His hand found a square, heavy book. He hefted the volume and eased around a book of news around a bulk of newspaper cases. The light angled towards him. Using all of his force, he hurled the book at the light. Pages fluttered the air as the volume winged for its target. It struck Ballard. The light danced crazily. Yet a book was no match for a hunting bow. Logan checked the space around him for a more effective weapon. Found none. Began to go through his pockets as the light stalked him. His fingers touched a forgotten bulge. The muscle pad he'd taken from the platform at Cathedral. Did he dare use it? The drug could tear him apart. Ballard was advancing. There was nowhere to run. Logan knew he had no choice. If muscle killed him, it killed him. He'd be dead either way. He brought the pad up to his nose, squeezed it sharply, and inhaled twice. His body exploded. Fire scoured his tissues. His eyes blurs, tendon wrenched. He began shaking violently as the powerful drug took effect. The light pinned him. Ballard raised the bow. Logan was a dazzle of hot motion. He saw the arrow laze from the bowstring and float lightly toward him. He had all the time in the world to avoid it. He stepped aside to let it pass. He could feel a terrible pressure inside his body as he watched the arrow slide smoothly into the spine of a thick volume. Finally, the pressure vanished and he relaxed, feeling his power. With easy grace, he stepped towards the tall figure silhouetted in the doorway. The figure seemed suspended there. In the time it took Logan to reach him, Ballard had moved the bow only two inches. Logan deftly plucked the weapons from the man's figure and continued towards the square patch of light which was on the outside world. He saw Jess, a still, wide-eyed statue, hands to her mouth. She swept, he swept past her down the stairs to scoop up the gun. The drug effect was easing. He was slowing. He stopped. He covered Ballard with the gun. Out, he said, out into the light. Oh, Logan, said Jess in happy relief. Logan could feel his heart flopping like a toad inside his chest as the drug left him. He steadied himself against the doorway as Ballard moved out into the fading sunlight. Tell him, urged Jess. Convince him. Tell Ballard you're a runner, just as I am. But I'm not, said Logan flatly. I guess I never was. Ballard was right in trying to kill me. All the warmth drained out of Jessica's face. She blanked, blinked as if from a physical blow. Sit down, said Logan, both of you. Jess was shaking her head slowly, unwilling to believe what she was seeing. Ballard took her arm and they sat down on the wet stone steps. I'm going to kill you, said Logan. I've got to kill you. Near them, the great cat lay sprawled in a heap of soaked gold and black. Flies and gnats and ants had already gathered to contest the corpse. They crawled into its gaping mouth over the ivory teeth, cloaking the tongue that lolled flaccidly, succumbed the unblinking yellow eyes. Logan said, There's one thing I'd like to know. His glance flicked to Ballard's right hand, to the red flower that glowed there. I've seen fakes, but nothing like yours. Tattoo artists, surgeon, chemists, they've all tried to duplicate the flower, but it's tamper-proof. Yet you've lived two lifetimes and that flower is real. How? How have you gone on living? One day at a time, said Ballard with a trace of a smile. Logan leveled the gun. I'll tell you, said Ballard. It won't make any difference if you know. Jess could not... Logan could not look directly at Jess. Couldn't meet her eyes. I'm a statistical freak, said Ballard. When I was born, something went wrong in the nursery. The hourglass malfunctioned, and the crystal it placed in my palm was imperfect. I didn't know this until I became twenty-one and my hand failed the blink. The flower stayed on red, and I lived on while others died. I don't need to hear any more, said Logan. He stepped to the edge of the steps, cupped his lips, and shouted, Francis! The cry echoed off into the jungle to be smothered by the heat and darkness. Logan called him again. Francis! This way! Here! He waited. Francis did not appear. Ballard turned to Jess. He's a DS man. It's his life. It's what he was trained for. 
He kept his voice low as Logan scanned the jungle. There's one consolation. He'll never find the others, the runners in Sanctuary. Jess looked intently at him. Then, there really is a sanctuary? A place where people can grow old, have a families, raise their own children? There is. Logan shouted again, received no answer. He walked over to them. I know I could never make you tell me where Sanctuary is, he said to Ballard. But after you're dead, the line will be broken. Ballard said nothing. Logan brought up the gun, set on Homer. The single charge would kill them both at this range. Goodbye, Jess, he said softly. I have to do this. Logan pulled the trigger. His hand was stone. The trigger finger would not move. He tried to fire, could feel muscles lock in conflict in the hand. His face went gray. The hand would not obey him. He saw Jessica's face and only Jessica's face. It was a white oval against the dark building, her eyes filled with pain and accusation. Logan slumped back against the wall, slid down it loosely. He was making sounds, but not words. The gun dangled limply in his hand. Ballard stood up with Jess beside him. He took the girl aside, keeping an eye on Logan. The DS man was blind to their words and movements. I knew he could never do it, said Jess, watching Logan with pity. You can trust him now. Not at all, said Ballard. But why? After what he's... Logan is a man in torment. He's in a near trance at this point, babbling, totally exhausted. Inwardly, he's torn. Half of him wants to run, escape, live. The other half wants to destroy me and you, to cross the sanctuary line and justify his entire existence. Right now, I couldn't tell you which half will win. Ballard paused. You'll have to go the rest of the way alone. But I love him, protested the girl. You can't ask me to abandon him now. Alone, said Ballard sharply. Listen to me. The final ca stage is Cape Steinbeck, and he checked the time. You've only 28 minutes to get there. If you fail to make it, they'll leave without you. Don't argue. You'll find a maze car at the platform just below Capitol Hill. Now go. I'll take care of Logan. He turned from Jess back to the hunched figure. The blow which knocked him unconscious was totally unexpected. And that's where I'll end part 13. Next up will be chapter 1.